Welcome to a special presentation from the 2019 Symposium on AA History, February 1st to 3rd in Los Altos of the San Francisco Bay Area. The debate over special purpose groups is the title of this presentation. It features Millie T. from San Francisco sharing her own lived experiences as part of a special purpose AA community, and uh, moi going through some slides and some uh, research. One way to look at underrepresented populations in AA is, in one way, there's two kinds, those that can be closeted and those that can't. Face-to-face -face in AA, women, young people, ethnic minorities can't hide. Atheists and agnostics, the LGBTQ AAs, can and sometimes do hold back their true selves for a number of personal reasons, including reactions from the phobias of others who fear and or are hostile towards these not as visible uh, minorities in recovery. Members have been told they can't be homosexual and live a sober life in AA. Atheists have been given the same ill-informed warnings. It's great that this symposium comes from San Francisco. It has a rich history of AA diversity. The first ever Western Roundup of Living Sober was held uh, June 25th to 27th in San Francisco in 1976. 198 people attended that first one. The Living Sober Conference would eventually attract up to 5,000 people and inspire LGBTQ gatherings throughout the AA world, Canada, U.S., and beyond. This presentation is one of many by archivists, filmmakers, writers, playwrights, and others who have done primary research into AA history. This is a free audio-visual sample. A complete set of the digital audio presentations can be purchased for $20 for all of them. Or you can order CDs if you prefer. Details of how to get a hold of them uh, we'll give you at the end. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you from San Francisco, Miley T. It really gives a one alcoholic talking to another account of what we're talking about today. Let's go to Los Altos. My name is Miley. I'm an alcoholic. I've been asked to share about my personal experience with this topic. And this is the, for the debate over special purpose groups. So again, my name is Miley and I'm an, I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is July 13th, 1984. I live in San Francisco. My home group is the Women's Kitchen Table Group on Tuesday nights. And my sponsor is Ruth S. Uh, Ruth lives in Pacifica, California. She got sober in 1965 in Mendocino State Hospital for the Insane. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth was at my very first AA meeting, and uh, she's been keeping an eye on me for the last 34 years. I'm really lucky that Ruth is my sponsor. When Ruth came in, her sponsor, uh, she described as a very good-hearted woman, a woman who really cared about her, a woman who wanted to support her sobriety. But she told Ruth that she couldn't be both gay and sober. She that you know she cared about Ruth, but that in her mind homosexuality was a sin, and that sinning and sobriety could never work. So, um, yeah. so, um, so, so, so Ruth actually Ruth actually left AA, you know, because being gay is not something that you can change, you know. And um, and it, it's not that this woman had any malice. That was just her understanding. Um, and so, um, but thank God, thank God, Ruth eventually did find her way back to AA. She's been sober now 53 years. Uh, she's 83 years old. I was just texting her this morning. And um, 
and she's been a blessing, a blessing for our community. Uh, she and her partner, Dee, who has now passed, uh, were instrumental in starting a, a Monday night lesbian group in San Francisco. And at the time, they were up to like 125, 100, you know, plus uh, women there every Monday night. And she... Um, she just was a leader in our community, and she, you know, one week we did the traditions, one week we did the steps, one week we did the literature. You know, we we were we were doing the deal, right? You know, she this wasn't just some sort of like fake AA. This was the real deal, you know. <laughs> and she was gonna make sure that we we all understood exactly what Alcoholics Anonymous was, especially the third tradition, you know. And she really taught us. She, I mean, it wasn't just her, of course, but because she was the oldest, because she had such long-term sobriety we all looked to her of course we had rotating you know service positions we all had the opportunity to be secretary treasurer of literature but she is she's such an important person in our in our world and um you know and for me you know i started drinking when i was 14 years old i came out when i was 17 years old i wasn't happy about it i didn't want this for myself you know this was the 1970s um, my family sure as heck didn't want this for me, and um, things, you know, things had already gone downhill. My life was already in the skids, and this was just sort of the last horrible straw for me. And I remember really looking to God and saying, like, seriously, really, this is what, uh, isn't it enough what I've been through? I've got to do this now, too. And, um, you know, and I, I left home at 17. I dropped out of high school, and I eventually found my way to San Francisco. And I was so naive. I actually didn't even realize there were gay people out outside my town. I thought the people I knew, I thought that was it, just the people in my town. And then eventually I heard San Francisco, got to San Francisco, and uh, I really, there was, back then, and it wasn't the dark ages, but I mean, you know, it, it wasn't like it is today, that's for sure. And um, so, and luckily at the age, I actually started trying to get sober at 19. I come from a long line of alcoholics who know jails, institutions, and death. There was denial is not part of my story. I knew exactly that I was an alcoholic, and I knew that I desperately had to stop. I um I tried for two years on my own, and um so I uh, I found my way to Living Sober conference that that year. There were four thousand. That's the LGBT conference in San Francisco. Four thousand people were there. It was amazing, and for me it just it just opened up. That was my first day of sobriety. My first day of sobriety was at a conference, and um. And what I want to say is that these special purpose groups brought me here today. You know, there's no way I could ever be, I, you know, I thought I only knew one person coming here today. But even if I didn't know anyone, I still would have come here today. You know, because I know the hand of AA is there for me. I know you all love me. What's not to love, right? And, uh, and I know that I would be welcome here. And I know that anyone in this room would do anything to help me stay sober. You know, and, um, you know, rigorous honesty is a part of our program. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're a lesbian gay, you, it's not obvious who's who. This side of the room's looking a little gay over here, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but you really can't tell. You know, you really, you don't know. And so it's always every day you have to make a decision about, even at breakfast, I decided, oh, am I going to say something? Not going to say something. Do I mention my wife of 27 years? You know, every day I have to make a decision. So, to have that, the special purpose group really gave me the strength to come here. I've been able to go to Akron and see the archives. I've been to Stepping Stones. I've been to Vermont, seen the Wilson Hotel. I mean, I love it. You know, I've gone to Atlanta. I can't wait to go to Detroit, you know. And, uh, and that, those things gave me the strength and the confidence and taught me about AA so that then I could then go out into the world and feel secure and feel safe. So thank you so much. Yeah. So, now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, and our next speaker is Joe C. from uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. His bio is, Joe is a published author, blogger, and host of a recovery podcast. His home group is Beyond Belief, Agnostics and Free Thinkers Group of Toronto, Ontario. He is going to be discussing the debate over special purpose groups. Please help me welcome him to the podium. I, I don't know about coincidence, and I certainly uh, am certainly not clear on any kind of divine intervention, but I came to AA and it didn't work, and then I came back and this was here and it did work. 
So uh, uh, do these pamphlets help? Uh, I don't know. And when was that? Uh, during disco. So you'll just have to look up. When uh, Rod Stewart's Tonight's the Night was a, a hit song. And uh, it was actually a band for the, uh, lo- from some radio stations for the line, uh, spread your wings and let me come inside. Uh, the uh, regulators didn't know what that meant. And uh, so in many places, the Rod Stewart song wasn't allowed. We still loved his stuff from like, you know, the Maggie Mae days yeah. and, uh, you know, yeah, the faces and the, the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we didn't object to that at all. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what are, are we going to talk about? I, I, here's what I can tell you, because Jackie fell into this, too. She had 25 hours of research and material and an hour to do it in. And uh, same here, but all I know is I'm going to give you an hour's worth. Uh, we're going to be the best of friends, and I'm going to finish on time. And uh, everybody can have these slides. Uh, we'll just make sure if I just mention one sentence off of something, and uh, you need the other one, uh, we'll uh, get it done. I'm going to borrow uh, from uh, a mentor. We're going to try to keep this in uh, some sort of order. We're going to give some sort of context. So when you're looking at special interest groups, I'm going to look at some of the groups that stayed and some of the groups that left. You know, the the problem with the truth is there's so many versions of it and uh, multiple perspectives, because I didn't choose the title of the debate, and there is a debate, and I'm neither for nor against on many of these issues. I'm just the delivery guy, and we know what happens to them some of the time. Okay. I was looking for an uh, Andrew Solomon quote, and I grabbed this one, which is, uh, I don't accept subtractive models of love, only additive ones. And I selected it because I thought it said, I don't accept subtractive models of love, only addictive ones. (laughs) And then I put it in there. I go, oh, well, that's good, too. (laughs) Uh, So we're going to look at different AA gatherings. This won't all be way back when, when two people meet, because the thing about AA history is it's going on right now. AA isn't something which happened way back when. I hope we're not even in the middle of the story. We'll talk about resentments in coffee pots and how they've helped AA proliferate. Context, uh, Uh, There's a three-letter word in Tradition 5 which uh, should end the debate, and uh, we'll look at that. We'll look at our own uh, microaggressions. Like, we all have biases, right? Uh, The best we can do is be aware of them and try not to include them in our language when we're talking with uh, people, when we're trying to spread the message. Uh, Okay, so this is the chronological part. The first uh, sort of special interest group was for doctors. It happened in 1949 near the Canada-U.S. border. And uh, they very quickly added Al-Anon and Alateen to what they were doing. Um, Again, all these slides are going to be available to you. Um, uh, And their next one is in Knoxville, uh, Tennessee. The International Conference of Young People in AA. Start graving silver since 1958. (laughs) That was a Toronto Young People's uh, Conference uh, theme, and uh, I I thought everyone was using it. (laughs) That's our our new uh, pamphlet cover. Hope you like it. Some people would say respectfully they should be in suits and ties, Uh, but, uh, you know, a committee came up with it. I like it. Not everybody will. That's just the way things go, right? And uh, this is the entire history of the International Conference of Young People in AA. And uh, this was my first special interest group because uh, I can tell you this, when Rod Stewart was transitioning from blues to disco, I was a teenager. So it, it's been uh, all over the place. And uh, I was involved in a bid committee, an unsuccessful bid committee that never won. We were trying to bring it back to Toronto. And we didn't succeed, except we all stayed sober, traveling from conference to conference to bid. And and then Montreal came, and they had such cute accents. <laughs> and, the, and on their first bid, oh, everyone was in tears, and it was going to Montreal. So we knew it wasn't coming back to Canada for 10 years. 
And uh, and I'm from Montreal, right? So I thought, well, the good side here is I don't have to organize anything. I don't have to be stressed out like the committee is here. You know, I can just go to Montreal and have a good time. So it was a, a, a very good consolation prize. Uh, women in AA, there's the new pamphlet here. Uh, here's something right out of this uh, pamphlet. When I got to the front door, I panicked momentarily, thinking of turning back. That's when I saw a woman approaching and asked, do you know where the AA meeting is? She smiled and said, yes, I'm going there too. Follow me. Uh, and that uh, you know, is true of any AA, and that is certainly true of someone who thinks they're different. Um, I have a very recent intel uh, on my cell phone with the uh, chairperson of uh, uh, next weekend in L.A. Uh, is the International Women's Conference, and they already have 3,800 people registered for that, and, uh, you know, and 120 um, uh, what do you call them? Scholarships. People who couldn't afford to go and, uh, and, you know, who knows what the total will be, but it was in Arizona, there was, uh, over 3,500 as well. And, uh, is that a big number or a little number? I don't know how many people should be there, right? Uh, celebrating, uh, uh, AA. Uh, so for the first four years, interesting, it was in Kansas City, uh, 65 to 69. And just like uh, um, the symposium for four years stayed in one place, so that, that's kind of a neat idea while you're learning the ropes to just sort of let's keep it in one place, deal with one hotel, or if this hotel isn't working, work with another one. And then before you start moving it around, I, I thought, I, I don't know why or how that happened that way, but I thought it was a really uh, a good idea. Uh, let's see. Let's Okay, here's a game. Insert the blank. Blank are only tolerated in AA. They are the orphans of AA. Now, this could be any special interest group for sure. Uh, we talked about the first African-American members. Uh, someone was talking about the LGBTQ community. Um, this was 1953, and this was an article in Grapevine uh, by women. Uh, I never dreamed there existed so much hostility towards women, alcoholics, until I started to attend AA meetings. We have stigma out there, but her experience was that there was more stigma inside AA. And this was before the International Conference. This was 1953. So, yeah, anyway... Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you some more of that uh, in your email. <laughs> and there are many subtle undercurrents and much hush-hush about them, women, without going into the smaller but uh, never, nonetheless significant details concerning these undercurrents and actions. I say there is much room for improvement and many possibilities for change. That is why I am in favor of women's discussion groups where a new member who is shy, timid, and very self-conscious may ask questions where she is accepted wholeheartedly. Uh, international lawyers, they're people too. And, uh, you know, so when they gather, it's a legitimate AA meeting. Okay. And uh, they didn't start from scratch. They learned a lot from the international doctors. And uh, they also started close to the Canada-U.S. border with a combination of Canadians and Americans uh, involved in it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they were indebted to the IDAA. And, um, uh, you know, they, uh, they were in Vancouver recently. Does anyone know where next year's is? No one's going to admit to being a lawyer here. That's okay. Closeted <laughs> law. Okay. Uh, the uh, 80s, in in a sense, I mean, the, the, this thing didn't happen as a, a one-timer, but it was a gradual thing. As Barry said at the uh, Montreal, where we celebrated the 50th, uh, his experience was we weren't in the closet. We were locked in vaults talking about the LGBTQ community. And it was the last AA uh, talk he would ever give uh, was in Montreal in 1985 uh, to a gathering of uh, LGBTQ uh, members in uh, Montreal. And um, 
So uh, that was cool. And um, uh, the new swankier pamphlet is now with uh, 20, 36 more pages. Uh, <laughs> no, now 36 pages. So it's, it's bigger and better. And the uh, stories have been updated. It's been talked about how our, this part of our literature is a living document. We, we don't seem to have any problem with dogma slowing us down. Uh, let's update the language. Let's, you know, speak to today's newcomer. And uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, let's see. I haven't seen these for a while, so I'm just kind of discovering these with you. Great website, the Gala website. That's how that's uh, pronounced. Um, they, their intention uh, is not to uh, be political at all, but just to be a part of AA and to cooperate with AA. Their last newsletter was very excited about going to Detroit, doing a site visit, looking at where the hotels are and all that sort of thing. Uh, they do uh, survey their uh, membership, and so the things that are really important to them Provide an online directory of known LGBT-friendly meetings. Uh, over 80% of people like that. Uh, provide an online directory of uh, known LGBT-friendly roundups, and so on and so forth. So what should AA do? Just ask the members. What a great presentation we had last night. And it would be all right for you to applaud uh, because, you know, I, uh, I cried. I laughed. It was absolutely wonderful. 2005, Toronto. The first uh, conference where uh, Six Nations Reserve, which is just south and west of uh, Toronto, uh, led a parade of flags uh, with the Eagle staff. You know, that's been our tradition ever since, if, unless I'm mistaken. And by the way, this is a living document too. So for the rest of you uh, fact checkers in the audience, uh, please let me know if I got a date wrong, if I got a name wrong or something. You know, maybe I'll do this presentation again and I'd like to update it. Earlier this century, in California, just south of here, the first gathering of agnostics, atheists, free thinkers, skeptics, doubters, you know, we don't even know what to call ourselves. Uh, in, in fact, the, the conference has never had the same name twice. <laughs> you know, because we get concerned with what other people, uh, how other people are going to define us or pigeonhole us or, or whatever else. It went from uh, Santa Monica to uh, Austin, Texas. Lisa and I uh, drove across the border on our way. We drove down from Toronto to uh uh, Austin because you get to see more that way. And um, we drove across the border the day after the 2016 election, listening to uh, what I call NPR in denial, <laughs> talking about when do they do the recount and all that sort of thing. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting. And then we got to host it in Toronto, and some of you were there, and thanks for coming. So these are sort of uh, agnostic atheist meetings, humanist meetings, some of them call them. Uh, there's one called uh, She Devils, which is a women's online uh, agnostic meeting. In Brooklyn at 11 p.m., you can go to the Ungodly Hour, which is an agnostic <laughs> meeting. And then there's the uh, Oh My God meeting, which is uh, our mostly agnostic group of drunks. Right. And that's in Orlando. So um, so once you kick one thing out, you know, you can get pretty uh, the uh, sort of artistic liberty just gets out of hand. The Internet has been a, a really big thing in getting like minded people together. Even people in the Bible Belt who don't share the local world view can find members of AA that they can communicate with. Statistically, uh, this 500 meetings isn't one half of one percent of all of AA. So if you if a, uh, if you are a demographer, you would know that it wouldn't even show up in a. But you know we're excited, <laughs> and for those <laughs> for that for whatever number of people that attend those uh, uh, 500 meetings, uh, they're glad they're there. Thanks everybody. This was the. Um, this came out uh, last year, um, and uh, it was the most pre-ordered grapevine book uh, to date. Was uh, one big tent atheists and agnostics experience strength and hope, and the God word. 
agnostics and atheist AA members. If you're unaware of the history, it was like uh, A Newcomer Asks, which was originally conference approved in Great Britain. It wasn't available in Canada, U.S. It uh, was adopted by uh, our general service office. And this pamphlet uh, was brought into the uh, conference approved fold in the U.K. Uh, around 2014, I think. And uh, we now have it. And I just learned it is now available in French and Spanish. And I think that is fantastic in terms of a way to help carry the message. Really, that was uh, my heart uh, is uh, is just pounding with uh, gratitude. 1975 was the first time the uh, General, Curve, uh, General Conference Literature Committee dealt with a letter from an AA member saying, hey, I'm an atheist. I know it won't be a bestseller, but it'd be really great if there was a pamphlet that sort of talked about us in AA because, you know, in 75, we were now, what, 40 years old, right? So we, we kind of knew that just like you don't have to tell someone that, oh, you know, I love you because you're gay, but if you want to get along with everybody else, wouldn't it be helpful if you just behaved more heterosexual? And in AA, in early AA, there was a belief that a certain worldview would be more effective than another worldview. And this guy was trying to say in 1975 that just, you know, let us tell our story in our own way, right? You know, we're not trying to change the world. We're not trying to deconvert or convert anybody. Uh, and now we have it. Is AA growing or fracturing? We talked about the coffee pot and the resentment. Now you can get the T-shirt. <laughs> 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 so let's look at some of the sort of underrepresented populations uh, in some cases and uh, the pamphlets that came from them. If I'm correct, the lower the P the older the pamphlet. So this will give you some sort of chronology of when they came. Uh, young Peoples and Women's might have been in the same conference, 1953. Uh, inmates, uh, Do You Think You're Different, came out in 76, and they thought, great, we've got 16 stories there. It's the last pamphlet we'll ever have to do. Everybody will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Native North America, older members, Newcomers, the LGBTQ, uh, problems other than alcoholism, armed forces, black and African American members, and accessibility. We talked about like microaggressions and sometimes we create a barrier without intending to. Try using the expression walk the walk to someone in a wheelchair, right? You know, our uh, Toronto conference is still greeted with uh, you know, if you go there in March first weekend, and you're all welcome. See you there. You know, there is a stage with stairs and no ramp. What, what does that tell someone coming into a meeting for their first time about whether or not there are two classes of alcoholic members, two classes of those who can participate and those who can't? And and we keep telling them the hospital, uh, not not the hospital, the hotel has a ramp. Right. We, I'm pretty sure of that because we're not the only one that goes there. And just because this is the way it's always been done doesn't mean it's the best way of doing things. So uh, I consider the accessibility. And, and I learned in when I worked on the accessibility com committee, something very useful, that my mobility is temporary. I learned about things that were going to be useful to me uh, sometime in the future if I don't look left in the UK uh, for oncoming traffic and walk into the street and get hit by a right-coming bus. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so let's let's take a look at, uh, I love, I'm a numbers guy, the uh, resentments, the coffee pots, and uh, what we do with starting our own groups. In 2000, we had uh, 2.1 million members and 100,000 groups. And in 2018, we've got about the same number of members and 20,000 more groups. In fact, just from 2017 to 2018, we saw a small decline in membership and 2,000 brand new groups. So, um, so, you know, I'm going to go and do it the right way. And, you know, it, it's the right way. It, it is appealing to a certain, but it isn't increasing AA membership. 
Uh, so I, I don't know what this means, and I don't know why everybody went and started their own meeting. I, I can't speak to that, but but I have been to meetings that have started between 2000 and 2018, and they're great AA meetings. And I, I don't know what this means, but I thought I would share it with you. <laughs> more yin and and yang. To widen our gateway, we have to have more choice. Also, you know, like... Uh, you know, does one create the other, right? Do more liberal meetings inspire people to uh, have a more ritualistic meeting? Do do those ritualistic, and we've always done things this way since 1948 meetings, inspire other people to, you know, let's, let's read something else, let's do something else. And uh, so I think there is a symbiotic relationship between all of our meetings because everyone you're debating with loves AA as much as you do. That's really important to remember. Okay, can it be too wide? For those of you listening at home, we're looking at a picture of a middle-aged or older man uh, with his wife kind of aghast looking at him, staring at the neighbors through binoculars saying, we've got some seriously creepy neighbors. <laughs> the, the last thing written in, in many ways, it's on the last page of the AA service manual in the warranty six. We set such a high value on our great liberty and cannot conceive a time when they will need to be limited. Mutual trust should prevail that no action ought to be taken in anger, haste, or recklessness that care will be observed to respect and protect all minorities. Group freedoms, this debate we're having or discussion, we, they were having in 1974 at the conference. Part of the discussion was, again, we're going to look at different sides of the story, uh, special interest groups that exclude some alcoholics from memberships is not creating unity, and but dividing the fellowship, which is contrary to our first tradition. So we had someone come up and say that a special interest group was a bridge to AA and someone else that in their experience, in their love of AA, is concerned uh, that it would divide AA. But but I would say I'm a, a word guy. I like words. And I would say that uh, is the tradition one about unity or uniformity? If you haven't met someone you don't like in AA... You got to get to more meetings, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and in that respect, you know that uh, you know all of us are AA members. The people we love, the people we don't love so much, the people who teach us so much. Let's put it that way. Um, let's go to another slide. Okay, this was uh, something in Cleveland, 1946. Again, it, the concern was with the, the first African American meetings. We honestly believe that. A fraternization will bring nothing but disharmony, suspicion, and intolerance. The devil's weapons. Uh, so uh, anyway, that was that was uh, in the the, the newsletter, the uh, Central Bulletin. But it represented people who loved AA, who were concerned about our future. Uh, and that was a long time ago. This was in Toronto, recently this uh, century. Uh, when uh, a human rights dispute was taking place in the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal because the Toronto Intergroup had delisted groups for being uh, secular, for being agnostics and atheists, saying that's not AA. And Intergroup argued that a belief in God was a bona fide requirement of joining Alcoholics Anonymous. They were trying to defend their position. So that was, this is 1946. This is 2014, right? And this is in the public record. And, uh, you know, uh, that was mediated. This issue was mediated and groups in Toronto, uh, it's page eight news. Most people in inner group don't even know what ever happened, right? You know, they just, they've only been here 18 months. Uh, yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and what's that thing about great truth? First, it's ridiculed. That's ridiculous. Your higher power is dumb. <laughs> then it's uh, uh, opposed, right? It becomes, uh, you know, uh, and uh, then it's accepted as obvious. 
there was an era of uh, closeted LGBT uh, members. There has been an era, and there is today in some regions, of closeted uh, agnostics and atheists because uh, they just hear how other people talk about, I wouldn't want anything an atheist had in AA. Okay, well, maybe I won't speak my mind about step three. And uh, I'll just pass, you know. So we can't tell people how to behave in a meeting. We can only lead by example. So here are some groups that stayed, and here are some groups that left. I didn't bring my notes for this. I had all these dates. What year did NA start? Someone here knows. 1953. Okay. It, Jimmy K. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, but originally the NA meetings were part of AA. They were AA meetings for people who had alcoholism and uh, other problems other than alcohol. And uh, how about uh, All Addictions Anonymous? Anyone a member here? <laughs> okay, Women for Sobriety, 1975, CA. Starting date? I'll go to Jay if someone else doesn't have it. Yeah, yeah, it came out of the 80s. But, you know, what do they do there that is an AA? Could it have been an AA meeting? Yeah, it could have been an AA meeting. And is it is it bad or sad that they formed their own fellowship? I, I don't think so. They seem to be doing fine. Uh, SOS, the Secular Organizations for Sobriety, a guy named... Uh, James C. was an AA member, still may consider himself an AA member. He considered AA a religion in denial, and uh, he didn't feel like he belonged, and uh, he started uh, his own fellowship, and many have come from that, uh, the Wellbriety movement. Uh, when was, uh, when was Wellbriety formed? 91? Is that, am I right? Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, celebrate recovery. Uh, they're probably growing faster than the atheist agnostics are. They are doing great. And this is a community that really embraces their addicts and alcoholics. I mean, there's all kinds of extracurricular activities. Uh, they're doing a great job at, you know, uh, you know, ending stigma and helping people. And, you know, could they be an AA meeting? Uh, depends who you ask. Right? <laughs> I got some nods going both ways here. I'm not wading into that water. <laughs> uh, 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 smart recovery. Uh, this is the first uh, DAA, this is Drug Addicts Anonymous, was the first 12-step program that ever started outside of uh, North America. It was started in Scandinavia. And they are old, old school. Uh, they go with the, uh, by the book and the uh, Oxford, uh, what do they, they call those? The, uh, not, I was going to call them the four agreements, but the, that's them damn Taoists. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so they have incorporated like, you know, real old school Oxford approach to uh, recovery. But could it be an AA meeting? Uh, yeah, depends who you ask. And uh, refuge recovery. And this was uh, the son of a AA member. He was a second generation alcoholic addict. He was also a Buddhist. Uh, he wrote a, a book called uh, uh, Punk Dharma Punk or Punk Dharma. Dharma Punk. Dharma Punks. Yeah, exactly. And then he wrote another one called uh, Refuge Recovery. AA, the last house on the block. Who said that? Not anymore. <laughs> um, so, what is this three-letter word in Tradition 5 as we're, you know, looking at what they're doing over there in their group? And in Grapevine in uh, 1977, our primary purpose and special purpose groups, these groups feel that labels serve the purpose of attraction, double identification, two-spirited, and are not intended to imply exclusion of other alcoholics. So 
it, in my humble opinion, is the important word in the fifth tradition. It's message. What is the AA message? Don't know. Because in uh, Idaho, it's going to seem maybe, a, you know, be delivered to me a little bit differently than it will in uh, Rouen, Rwanda, Quebec. Those French, they changed every word in AA. <laughs> Interestingly enough, N.A., their fifth tradition, is uh, to carry the message. And I looked into that. I called California to find out, was that quite intentional or was that a typo? Nobody knows why they have... Th uh, they speak in terms of one AA message. And really, maybe, you know, you could use either of those three-letter words and create an argument about it. And what about tradition four, three, two, and one, right? Like autonomy, except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole, does that mean you're completely autonomous until we tell you you're kicked out? Yeah, or does that mean you're completely autonomous, except there's this whole world of AA that we need you to get involved in. We need your opinion. We need your feedback. We need your help. We need your talents. We need your time. And uh, we need a little bit of your seventh tradition. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jim Burwell was a big factor in Tradition 3, as uh, we know in our AA history. And Warranty 6, I quoted from that a little bit. What would Uncle Bill say about uh, rogue groups? Uh, now, this was 1953. They were talking about groups that were changing the steps and traditions. Uh, so he was asked to sort of speak about this. And he had a, a lot to say about it. But some of the most interesting things was that these people who are changing that are really just, you know, employing the same sort of pioneering ways that the original members did, that they are suggested steps and traditions the traditions and steps reflect accurately what our experience has been. The alcoholic, no matter where in the world they may be, will eventually adopt the principles that will work uh, the best for him or her or it or they. What's sacred? Is it the wording? Is it the principles? And, and we looked at all these other fellowships that are working you know, there's uh, 25 million people in recovery in America. One million of them are AA members. And other people are doing other things. Now, some of them define their recovery different than you and I would. But um, these are people who self-identify as in recover from, you know, alcohol or other substance use disorders. Anytime we, find, we found a, a new problem in AA, uh, you know, you can overcome that by your AA history. And... Uh, uh, this is something Ernie read in that reflection thing I showed you earlier uh, that was from 1946. AA groups are fundamentally little bands of people who are friends who can help each other stay sober. Each group, therefore, reflects the needs of its own members. The way a group is managed is the way the members want it to be managed for their common benefit. As a result, we have large groups, small groups, groups which have refreshments, groups which are long meetings, groups which are short meetings, social groups, working groups, men's groups, women's groups, groups that play cards, groups which specialize in young people, and as many other varieties as there are kinds of people. Each group has its own customs, its own financial problems, and its own method of operating. As long as it follows as a group the same principles AA recommends for individuals on unselfishness, honesty, and decency, and tolerance. It is above criticism. So someone kind of ended the debate uh, kind of bluntly there. <laughs> <laughs> but I got more to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember... <laughs> Concept five about the uh, minority opinion, and uh, uh, you know, in a in a spirit of accommodation, you don't have to the the there is no tyranny of the majority, 
in other words, uh, when someone needs whatever it is, and I, I'm not entering into this debate, uh, a simple language big book, whether we should write one or not. In um, duty to accommodate mode, is that what you need? Can we afford to do that? Okay. We'll print you some. Or it's print on demand. Let me know if it's a bestseller. We'll print a bunch of them. There is no longer a, a minority group being given permission of uh, the majority. Just another way of looking at things. Progress is still being made. And really, I was talking about uh, the Ontario Conference and its uh, accessibility barrier, its visual accessibility. It also has a picture of... Uh, uh, Dr. Bob and, and, uh, Bill W, uh, up there. And so, only two pictures of two people, both white men of privilege. And what does that say to someone walking in the room for the first time? Uh, you know, hey, I feel comfortable here. These are my people. I can tell. <laughs> or something else, right? You know, and, and I'm not saying we have to undo our history. You know, I, I'm I'm great that we revere our founders, but how about a picture of our first African American member, or our first teenager, or you know, all of our firsts? Let's if we're gonna have our firsts, let's let's get them all. The essence of all growth is a willingness to change for the better, and then an un, uh, unremittent willingness to shoulder whatever responsibility that entails. That was right around uh, the. First time uh, AA was ever in uh, Toronto. And, uh, yeah, you'll have my contact information. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's the beginning of a conversation and not the end. And I'll make sure that anyone who wants them, you can have Jackie's uh, uh, things and whatever. And other than that, uh, how much time did you, you were about to put up the five-minute thing? No, you got about nine, eight, nine minutes. Okay, excellent. Okay, like I can keep going. But uh, I know... I know everyone here feels like they should have given this talk. <laughs> so uh, where is it? Uh, can you uh, be the... Uh, okay, okay, fantastic. Okay, let's turn this on and keep it away from that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, we have around, it seems like, 10 minutes remaining for, the, um, for questions. So I will come to you. Excuse me. Thank you, Matthew. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so, you know, I'm in a unique position because I'm an office manager, and so we have to make these decisions. And when the Toronto thing came about, my predecessors before, it was an arbitrary decision by the office manager what went into the directory and what didn't. And when this came, we had, and our board meeting goes, we need to have policy. You know, we we need to have something. And, you know, our board, we're, we're very good at, okay, it's not our job to make policy. It's our job to enforce the policies that our inner group wants. So we brought it to the groups. What what are the requirements to be listed in the Ventura County Directory? And the the first thing that came up was, okay, what if they rewrite the, the um, steps? We go back to Bill's writing. He had said, Clearly, in reference, I believe, the Buddha groups, changing to good. He said, look, they, they have that prerogative. They could fade out, they could, but their suggestions. Well, what about the writing, rewriting traditions? And like you said, we went with, um, what, what's the, what's the essence? Mm -hmm. You know, if they change the word, but it's still the same meaning, is, what are we doing? But the main thing that we, we wanted to do was, if a man, shows up at a woman's meeting from out of town, did they say go away? That was the inclusive part we wanted to look for, that no one would be turned away from any meeting listed in our directory. Mm -hmm. That was our primary purpose, and that was the only requirement. And so if we listed as a women's group and a man shows up, they let him in. And if it, you know, if it's a, you know, we don't have doctors or anything, but that was one of the main things our inner group wanted was the fact that everyone must be included within the thing. That's how we go, right or wrong, but that that's what we list. So. Thank you. And, and it was worthwhile to have the conversation. I'm sure it got heated. 
you know, and, but, you know, it, it just, we, we got to understand these things better. Hi, my name is Kevin, and I'm an alcoholic. First of all, thank you. Your presentation was wonderful. Um, and I just wanted to take the opportunity because I care about accuracy and when wrong, yeah, yeah, promptly please. admit it, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I misspoke a little earlier. And they actually started in 1950. The article was written in 1951. They were interviewing Jimmy K. But the writer of the article posed that question to Bill W. So I just wanted to correct myself. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Kevin. And, uh, you know, um, uh, there are two things, there are two, two minority groups I belong to in AA. Uh, one, I'm, I'm gay, and, and I'm really grateful for the gay groups of AA, especially uh, uh, Lavender Hill, number one in Berkeley. Uh, but I'm also a Catholic priest. Uh, I'm a practicing Catholic, and I'd just like to mention how uh, a microaggression can happen. Okay, and, and what that is, is, is I, I have been for 37 years of AA, and I've been blessed by all your different types of spirituality. When I was ordained, Alan, who was an atheist, said, I, I send my good energy in your general direction. Bless, best blessing I received that week. You know. <laughs> so, but in quite a lot of meetings, I hear my religion mentioned with hostility mm -hmm. and resentment. Now, if you were, and, and this is my experience in 37 years, if you are not Assemblies of God, Mormon, or in some places Baptist, you have probably never heard your religion mentioned at group level. There may be exceptions that you can tell me. But what I have heard, and, and sometimes it's, it's made me feel very unwelcome, is uh, people mention I'm a recovering Catholic. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, I, I'd like to mention two things. The big book... My sponsor, if you think you, 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 you can have resentments against a religion if you no longer belong to it, um, you can also have religions if you're still trying to deal with it. You know, There's uh, 1.5 billion Catholics in the world, and if you haven't met one who's a jerk, you're not looking. You know? <laughs> you know? But what, what I'm saying is, is the big book says that, 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 that when you list your resentments, you list people, institutions, and ideas. Now, I mentioned to that to this group because a lot of you are sponsors, and no matter how big the group is, there's no exception. It doesn't say, right, in it, if your group is this or that, you can have a resentment. And, and I, ha I had to have that pointed out to me. So that you're right, okay. So, so that's number one. The, the other thing that, that's, that's just a, a point of information for people who might be sponsoring someone who has problems with my particular religion, if you get up publicly and say, I no longer belong to this religion, you're off the books. So if, if someone is, is talking to you, and I've, you, know, you meet people who are 30 years and they haven't darkened the door of, of, of the community and they still have a resentment, all they have to do is get up and say, I no longer belong to this religion. You know, so it, go be something else. <laughs> My name's Ken. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. I got sober a long time ago, it seems. Um, I was at a conference in Sedona with Joe and a few other people, and... To add to the controversy, someone was describing that we all pretty much agree that this program of ours was inspired. It, it somehow or other, um, two old white Christian guys received the message somehow from somewhere. And when they codified that, they wrote it as if they were two white old Christian guys. However, if the message, the same message had been received by like a young black Muslim girl, we'd have a whole lot more young black Muslim girls here. And I, I, I think we, we start looking at trying to define what is and what isn't. And I just love the fact, you know, I had a a sponsee who wanted his dad for years to come to AA, and he went to a, 
a women's meeting, and they said, and it was a very, his dad finally said, I'll go. And they go to the meeting, and it's a women's meeting, and she says, you're not wanted here. And he never got sober. So, you know, I love that uh, only requirement is let them in. I don't care what you are, who you are. I didn't know. I, I was over a year of coming to AA before I knew I was an alcoholic. So let me in. <laughs> You're right behind you. Okay. Okay, we have time for one more. Great. Hi, I'm Claire. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Claire. I wanted to talk to a, a, a screenshot you did earlier and share an experience with this coffee pot in a room of resentment. Um, my home group is a rather large group. It was 125 people. And the church that we were practicing in or had our meeting on a Thursday night said, we really need the facility on Thursday night. We're giving you six months. Find another place. I um, happened to be in a hotbed of AA um, enthusiasm. And we started beating the bushes. And we could not find another facility that would welcome us. I heard a wide range of comments about, you know, I understand that you're a long-standing group in one thing and another, but if we let you in, you guys breed like rabbits. <laughs> and we need our facility. And if we let one of you in, then the next group's going to want to be in. And you're not the only A in this valley. And I started thinking about how are we being responsible to the communities that we involve when we want a 615 meeting, and I'm being very facetious, instead of a 6 o'clock or a 630. Because 615 is much much more convenient for me. And we talk about our, our need for, um, I was listening to Billy talk of, of the simple math. As we keep splitting me- meetings and splitting meetings and fracturing them up and taking it and doing over here, we dilute the concept of a group and we dilute our contributions because rents are going up and coffee pot, you know, coffee is expensive and it's very expensive in this area. We can't ignore that. So when we think of get a coffee pot, just go start your own meeting if you don't hear it. What am I doing to AA as whole? How am I affecting how AA is seen in my community? I really got a good look at how AA was perceived in my community. We were not an asset. We were leeches trying to get the low-end meetings and looking for a deal. And so I just add that to the discussion that if this meeting isn't working for you, go find a group. (laughs) Lynn, bring your energy to something else and help make it what you're looking for as opposed to getting a coffee pot and going somewhere else. Thank you. So once again, I'd like to thank thank our great speaker, wonderful presentation. Questions, comments, or visit rebelliondogspublishing.com. Email us right there or connect to our social media. For a complete set of audio recordings, including the history of AA on North American reservations, letters from Dr. Bob, AA in San Quentin Prison, early adaptation of AA in Latin America, early group problems in AA, and more, visit aahistorysymposium.org. From there, you can also register for the 2021 6th Symposium. Bay History. Thanks for hanging in with us.